I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a whole year, and here I am. And uh, I felt it was going to be intimate, and it is, but we're just about full up, and it's just perfect. So I'm going to start by reading two brief chapters from early in the book um, about Crane's time here, because I thought, why not? Here I am. We should share the Asbury Park stories. So the first of these two short chapters is 1890-ish, um, uh, when Crane was still in high school, finishing up high school. And here is the chapter. <clears throat> Those were the summers when he worked for his brother Toonley's news agency in Asbury Park. As a Jersey man myself, who also came into the world by way of Newark, I remember Asbury Park as a prime warm weather destination for adolescent boys and girls. Once my older friends turned 17 and had driver's licenses in their pockets, I tagged along with them on a number of Saturday excursions down the Garden State Parkway to visit the ocean, the boardwalk, and the best amusement park within an hour of home which had everything in it an amusement park should have, a carousel, a funhouse, bumper cars, a mirror maze, and New, New Jersey's most vertiginous stomach-churning roller coaster. Since I knew nothing about the origins of Asbury Park, I took it for granted that my favorite pleasure town was a for-profit venture devoted exclusively to the demands of the pleasure principle. So it had become by the early 1960s, but in the beginning it was something quite different. Not just a summer resort, but a bastion of the American Methodist Church. It started in the 1860s when Methodists discovered the Jersey Shore as a place to pitch their tents and build large open-air sh wooden shelters, tabernacles, in which thousands could congregate for communal prayer and worship during the summer. Ocean Grove, the queen of religious resorts, was established in 1869, and the following year, Methodist convert James A. Bradley, a wealthy brush manufacturer from New York who had visited one of the summer camp meetings there, bought 500 acres of oceanfront land just to the north and established another town, which he named after America's first Methodist bishop, Francis Asbury. Crane's parents had bought a lot at the Ocean Grove campground in 1872. I should mention, you probably know this, but Crane's father was a Methodist minister, and his mother was a devout Methodist and um, a temperance activist. Um, Crane's parents had bought a lot at the Ocean Grove campground in 1872, in other words, when Crane was a year old or six months old, which would account for Crane's mother's decision to re relocate there after her husband's death. But by the time the family moved to Asbury Park in 1883, the place had been transformed into one of the most thriving and crowded vacation spots along the East Coast. Its Methodist principles were still intact, a ban on the sale of alcohol, a Sunday ban on the sale of tobacco, and there was much religious activity in town. But this was an attractive part of the world, and once founder Bradley had built his gigantic boardwalk and the bungalows, cottages, houses, hotels, and amusement centers had gone up, people less fervent in their religious convictions began vacationing there as well. More than 600,000 per year by most reports, including day trippers, weekenders, and season-long summer residents. And with their arrival came the clandestine beer trucks, known as ARCs, and the Sunday prescriptions for, from local doctors for tobacco folium. <laughs> from mid-June to early September, Asbury Park was a human circus that offered visitors any number of entertainments, distractions, and cultural opportunities. The beach and the ocean, first of all, the social pleasures of dressing up in fine clothes and parading along the boardwalk, music recitals and concerts, dances at the grand hotels, commonly referred to as hops, courses of instruction on various subjects for both children and adults, 
everything from art classes to classes in marine biology, and a perpetual round of lectures that featured standard temperance harangues on the same day the talks were given about literary matters, Hamlin Garland on William Dean Howells, for example, and current social issues, reformer Jacob Rees on life in the New York slums. What a town it must have been for a cub reporter to learn his trade, and how enjoyable it is to imagine little Stevie Crane hustling along the boardwalk on his bicycle or lurking in hotel lobbies as he tracks down tidbits and scoops for his big brother Toonley, the redoubtable shore fiend of local legend. That's what they called Toonley. He was a famous newspaper man of the day, the shore fiend. <laughs> 